so today I will tell, I'll tell you about Bayesian particle polishing in every gory detail. This will take a lot of time, so I need to speak fast and uh, I hope we'll get through. Uh, so Bayesian polishing is a method to estimate beam induced motion. It is inspired by the original particle polishing from Relion, which has been around for some eight years or so. Unlike the original polishing, Bayesian polishing is based, built around a uh, rigorous Bayesian inference framework. And it has been described in this paper down here uh, last year. At least the single particle part is in that paper. Um, so first off, beam induced motion is the effect that uh, cryo -EM samples begin to move when they're illuminated by an electron beam. Uh, this produces blurry images, if not accounted for, and those damage the high frequency information in all the reconstructions that we make from those images. Now for a long time, now people have uh, collected movies instead of single micrographs and then tried to align the frames of those movies to correct for this beam induced motion. And the biggest problem with this is that the individual movie frames are extremely noisy. Typically we just uh, have something like one electron per angstrom, square, uh, angstrom squared per frame. Here you see an example. On the left, an image of a ribosome from an entire movie, and it is already quite noisy. You can barely see the ribosome. On the right-hand side, you see one single frame from a, a similar movie. It's not the same ribosome. Uh, and there you see that most uh, or many pixels don't even catch a single electron. Most of them catch one, and some few catch two or three. So the images are extremely noisy. Now, there have been many uh, motion correction methods proposed over the years. Uh, here I've just listed what I think are the most uh, widely known ones. And those fall into roughly two categories. Uh, on top, you see the, the pre-processing methods that operates on uh, entire micrographs. Those you would run at, at the very beginning before you have any particles or any reconstructions. Uh, at the bottom, you can see the uh, post-processing methods that operate on particles and try to increase the resolution of an already existing reconstruction. And Bayesian polishing falls into the latter category. So now my talk today will mostly focus on the original single particle implementation of Bayesian polishing. And at the very end, I will mention the most recent adaptation to tomography. So uh, Bayesian polishing consists of essentially three steps. First, we estimate the motion, then we measure the B factors of all the frames, and finally we recombine the frames using those B factors. Uh, but the motion estimation is of course the most uh, interesting part of it. So Bayesian polishing is built around Bayes' law, which tells us uh, the probability of some event A given some event B in terms of the inverse probability of B given A. And in our context, this means that we are looking for uh, a set of uh, particle trajectories T that are the most likely given the observed frames. And this posterior likelihoods, posterior probability of a set of trajectories is proportional to the prior probability of ever encountering the set of trajectories in the first place times the likelihood that that set of hypothetical trajectories would produce the frames that we observe. So the first term is called the prior and the second the data term or likelihood term. And now the overall strategy is one of local optimization. We initialize with some initial set of trajectories T0 and then we try we follow the gradient upward trying to uh, maximize the, this posterior probability of that set of trajectories until we reach some local and hopefully global maximum. Now, let's begin with the data term. Uh, in order to construct this, we need to know what the particle looks like. We need a high resolution 3D map of the particle, as well as uh, approximate positions of all the particles, as well as their angles, their defoci and beam tilt and everything that, uh, that we're, we need to predict what the particle would look like if, it weren't for, if there were no noise. And then we operate on little extracted images just to keep things tractable. Uh, pairs of images, one of them is what we observe, what they call the observation or the frame, and the other is the prediction that tries to uh, predict what that frame should look like without any noise. And uh, since we assume that the only difference between the prediction and the, the actual observation is just noise, uh, we model this noise as Gaussian. We do not assume that it is uh, uncorrelated. So we measure the power spectrum of the noise, we estimate it, and then we filter both the prediction and uh, the observation such that the noise in the observation becomes flat or white, so that it has a flat power spectrum. And then we can assume that the noise in the individual pixels is uncorrelated, and therefore, we can say that the probability of encountering all of the pixels 
is a product of the individual probabilities of encountering every single one of those pixels. And that probability is assumed to be Gaussian. And because it's a product of Gaussians, we can transform it into a, an exponential of a sum of uh, these individual arguments. Uh, and we see this is the L2 distance between the two images, the shifted frame and the reference. It doesn't matter which one is shifted. And now when you look at this more closely, we can multiply out the square. And then uh, since we are shifting the images in Fourier space, uh, these two terms, the quadratic terms, remain constants. Uh, this is because if you shift in Fourier space, then everything that leaves the image on one end comes back in from the other side. So uh, the sums never change. So we can factor them out. And what we're left with is twice the cross-correlation between the, the reference and the frame. And this cross-correlation image, of course, can be computed very efficiently in Fourier space. And that's what we work with. Now, uh, also, we want to look at multiple particles and multiple frames. And we can safely assume that the noise in those is uncorrelated. So again, the probability of seeing all the frames, given the hypothetical trajectories, uh, is equal to the product of, of all the individual uh, Gaussian probabilities, which, again, is just an exponential over a bigger sum now, the sum of all the cross-correlation values at the positions of all the particles in all the frames, multiplied by two. Now, a very important point here is that we need to work with the actual cross-correlation images. We never reduce them to their maxima because those are meaningless at this noise level. Here, an illustration. Uh, a toy example of a hypothetical 1D uh, correlation with a lot of noise added on top, a realistic amount of noise, really. And we see if we pick the maximum of this, it is nearly meaningless. And if we do this 100 times with 100 different realizations of noise, we see that the maxima form essentially a uniform distribution uh, where the density is slightly elevated above the true peak. But the mean of these maxima is nowhere near the true peak because this is not a normal distribution. It's essentially a uniform distribution with a tiny bump here. Instead, what we want to do is we would want to average all those noisy realizations and only then pick the maximum. Now, in this toy example, the particle is naturally moving, but this illustrates the principle. Um, and it is the prior probability that establishes the connections between the different particle positions in different frames for different particles. So uh, the prior probability is built around the following assumption, uh, that it is really the ice that uh, moves, deforms, and bends, and the particles just swim along. And based on this, we construct our prior uh, using three criteria. First, we assume that the overall extent of velocity is limited. That is, we assume that the velocity of any particle follows a normal distribution around zero. Second, we assume that the motion is spatially smooth. That is, uh, the motion at two different points in the ice, so two particles, P and Q, uh, is correlated, and that correlation decays exponentially over distance using this uh, smoothness parameter, spatial smoothness parameter, sigma d. And thirdly, we further assume that uh, the motion is also temporally smooth. That is, the velocity of any particle does not change uh, abruptly from frame to frame, but instead the velocity in frame f uh, follows a normal distribution around its velocity in the previous frame, f minus 1. And this, the parameter sigma a describes how much acceleration there is. This is equivalent to saying that the acceleration vectors follow, follow a normal distribution centered at 0. And with these three assumptions, we can now uh, construct a prior based on these three parameters. Uh, and we separate this prior into a spatial and a temporal component. And for the spatial component, we use the Gaussian process formalism to express this very elegantly. Um, so a Gaussian process is a generalization of the concept of a multivariate normal distribution to the infinitely dimensional space of functions. Now, the term process is very misleading here because we explicitly use Gaussian process for the spatial component and not for time. So our functions that we really look at are two-dimensional velocity fields in the plane uh, that can be evaluated by Gaussian process. That is, the Gaussian process assigns a probability to every such hypothetical continuous velocity field. And now the same Gaussian process defined by sigma v and sigma d is recycled for the entire data set. It never changes. But when we're then given a specific movie with a specific set of particles, a finite set of particles, we can project the Gaussian process onto those particles and construct the corresponding multivariate normal distribution, which is finite dimensional, so we can actually work with it. Uh, now, our Gaussian process is built from these first two assumptions, that the velocity is normally distributed and that the correlation decays exponentially. So with these two together, we construct the covariance function between two points uh, that looks like this. 
And uh, this covariance function is essentially what defines our Gaussian process in addition to the zero mean prior, which follows from symmetry. Uh, so this covariance function never changes. And then when we're given an actual set of particles, we just construct a covariance matrix uh, where we, into which we write these individual uh, co uh, covariances. And then we di diagonalize this covariance matrix, which uh, gives us a set of eigenvectors u that represents orthogonal ice deformation or particle motion components. And note that these matrices, the matrix u is dense. So uh, every component here shifts all of the particles at the same time in different directions by different amounts. And specifically, uh, the eigen components, the eigenvectors associated with greater eigenvalues are more likely and thus smoother because that's what their model demands. Uh, now, another thing we do is we scale each eigenvector by the square roots of its associated eigenvalue, which gives us basis vectors B. And uh, if we look at these basis vectors, we note that applying any one of those uh, takes us uh, precisely one standard deviation away from the mean. So the less likely components are shorter and the more likely ones are longer. So altogether, each one of those is equally likely. Or this is now equivalent to saying that if some set of velocity vectors for all the particles is given in this specific basis B, then the coordinates, uh, the coefficients corresponding to that basis uh, follow a standard normal distribution. Uh, that is, it, they look like this. We can read off the likelihood of every uh, configuration of motion vectors from the length of the co coefficient vector itself. And now important to note is that the basis B is only scalar. That is because our Gaussian process is isotropic. So uh, it, it makes no difference whether the, the motion is applied in X or Y direction. Uh, it's the coefficients themselves that carry two dimensions. So uh, our Q, our coordinate vector Q, contains two numbers, one for the X and Y direction, for every deformation component and every frame F. The deformation component I and frame F, I'll stick to this notation. However, the same basis B is shared among all the frames of the movie. This is because the particles don't move so much as to actually really change the covariance matrix significantly. And now, uh, so far we've taken care of the spatial uh, prior, spatial smoothness prior. Uh, for the temporal smoothness, we just uh, ensure that successive velocity vectors of each particle do not change so much, too much. That is, we again <coughs> uh, define a Gaussian. And now we would like to express this again in our uh, deformation coordinates Q. Uh, and the, the original transformation that we performed was orthogonal. So if we didn't, hadn't scaled the eigenvectors by lambda, uh, we could just measure these lengths in either coordinate system, but because we have, we need to consider this here. So the uh, less likely components um, also don't shift the particles so much, so we have to weight them down by scaling each square distance, uh, square difference by the corresponding lambda. And now with these three terms together, we, uh, we can construct our posterior probability. Uh, so at first you see the spatial smoothness term, which is just given by the lengths of the coordinates, coordinate vectors. Uh, second, the temporal smoothness term, which penalizes great, uh, great deviations, especially in the important components uh, in successive frames. And the data term, the cross-correlation, the exponential of twice the sum of cross-correlations. And now the cross-correlations have to be evaluated at the positions of the particles. Uh, so for that, we need to um, integrate up the, the motion of the particle up to that frame. Uh, and without loss of generality, we can assume that the unit of time is one frame. So then we just we can write that the position of particle P in frame F is equal to its position in the first frame plus the sum of its velocities up to that frame. And these velocities we can again represent in our uh, practical basis B using the coefficients Q. And now because this is again a product of Gaussians, we can uh, transform it into an exponential of a sum like this. And uh, because we're only interested in maximizing this and the exponential is monotonic, we can just drop it. And also change the sign and scale everything to look ni more, more nicely, look nicer. So uh, <clears throat> in the end, solving this problem is equivalent to minimizing this uh, cost function or energy function, if you will.
Uh, now this is uh, differentiable. Uh, the prior is, a tr is trivial. It's just a set of quadratic terms. For the data term, we need to access the cross correlation in a way that gives us continuous gradients. So we need to use at least cubic interpolation for this. With linear interpolation, the gradients would not be uh, continuous. And we do that, and then we can optimize this using a sophisticated optimization algorithm. Uh, this cost function does produce narrow allocated valleys. So uh, uh, it, it actually makes sense to use something like LBFGS and not just a straightforward gradient descent. And another problem is that uh, even though the regularizer or the priors do provide uh, convex terms, uh, the data term does not because the cross-correlation is just an arbitrary image. It won't, be it won't happen to be convex. So therefore we need to initialize with a good initial set of trajectories, typically a set of rigid trajectories. And uh, then we optimize from there and we hope that we can reach the global optimum locally. And when we do that, we, we obtain trajectories that look something like this. Um, note these are scaled up a factor of 32. So actually the particles don't move very much. It's still an, enough to damage the high resolution components. And we note that the trajectories in any region of the micrograph look similar. This is the spatial smoothness term. And also every one of them is uh, itself smooth. That's the temporal smoothness term. However, we expect to see this because those are the priors that we have applied. We need some method of telling us uh, whether the coefficients of those priors uh, are actually appropriate. So for this, we use a process of hyperparameter optimization. So uh, the, these three parameters that define our statistics of motion, uh, they vary from data set to data set. For example, if we use a, something like a graphene grid, then uh, sigma v, the overall amount of motion, can be almost halved. If, we, uh, if the data set features a lot of stage drifts, then both sigma v and the correlation length, length sigma d, that is the smoothness, the spatial smoothness, will both increase. Uh, if we look at uh, structures of particles that stick together, like helical filaments, for example, then this will also increase sigma d, but not sigma v. Uh, that is because the particles stick together, so they also tend to move together. Uh, so there's a red line on the screen. Um, and these three parameters can be estimated using a process of hyperparameter optimization, as I mentioned before. And the idea behind that is to um, select a subset of micrographs and optimize them over and over again using different uh, such parameter triplets. Uh, and to do this properly, we need to separate each particle in Fourier space into an alignment circle or training set and an evaluation ring, the test set on the outside with a slight gap in between to account for the limited size of the particle. Um, and then for every hypothetical parameter triplet, we align the subset of micrographs using only the alignment ring. The, the evaluation ring is hidden from the algorithm. So that in the end, we can use the evaluation ring to judge the alignments uh, that we have obtained and thus uh, evaluate how good these parameters are. And now the separation is actually really necessary because if we used all of the data for the alignment, then using a weaker prior would always give us uh, a better match in the end because the prior and the data term are always competing with each other. So we need to hide part of the data from the algorithm when we align. And furthermore, the cost landscape of these uh, uh, statistics of motion parameters, sigma v, sigma d, and sigma a, is uh, potentially nightmarish because by just changing the parameters a little bit, uh, the particles could settle in a completely different configuration. So uh, it could be theoretically something fractal or so. There's certainly no hope of getting meaningful gradients out of this. So we have to use a gradient-free optimization method like uh, the nelder mead downhill simplex algorithm, which is what we use. And once we've done that, we, have, we, we can obtain more reliable triplets of motion statistics parameters for this data set, and then we can align uh, the entire data set with those. And when we're done, we proceed to estimate B factors. Now this idea has been already uh, integrated into original particle polishing. And it means that uh, we measure one B factor for each frame index, not every frame, every frame number. Uh, and that B factor combines both radiation damage and the motion that we haven't accounted for yet, which is typically in the very early frames of the movie. And then in the end, we recombine the frames using these B factors such that uh, the low frequencies are taken from uh, all of the frames, but the high frequencies are only taken from the frames with the good B-factors. Uh, the difference here is that the new method of estimating B-factors is uh, 
literally thousands of times more efficient than the old one, and at the same time more robust. Um, so originally, one would reconstruct uh, a pair of 3D maps uh, for every frame index. So if your data set had 50 frames, you would need to reconstruct 100 3D maps just to measure FSCs between pairs of those to obtain B factors for each frame. In the new approach, we no longer um, correlate 3D maps. Instead, we correlate the aligned predicted particle images in 2D with the observed ones. And we perform the correlation uh, collectively for all the Fourier pixels for every given frequency, frequency K and frame index F. And all of those Fourier rings together form a cylinder, which is why I called this the Fourier cylinder correlation or FCC. So here you see an illustration. On the left, a stack of particles, uh, always say frame five of every particle and one specific uh, uh, frequency ring. And then the set of all those rings forms a cylinder. And now all the pixels uh, for the cylinder are correlated between uh, the predicted and the aligned observed images. So this gives us one pixel in this image here. And when you look at the image, the FCC, uh, where the horizontal axis represents frequency and the vertical axis time or frame, uh, we note that uh, most of all the high frequencies burn up over time, as we would expect. But at the same time, the very first frames are also not as good because uh, there's more motion in those and the motion is more disordered. And now the really practical thing about this is that we can update the FCC after aligning every individual movie. Uh, the FCC, like the FSC, is just a normalized cross-correlation. So what we do is we update these three sums after we're aligning every individual movie. So that once we're through with the whole data sets, uh, we already have the FCC and then fitting B factors to that only takes seconds. Where with the previous approach, we would now spend an additional day of processing time, typically constructing many, many 3D reconstructions just to correlate them. And in addition to that, fitting B factors to the FCC can be done in a much more robust way than to the FSCs, which is done, being done using a linear Guinea fit, which is difficult if the FSCs are very bad. Uh, so here you see how this is done. On top, you see the F FCC and below the fit. And now the fit is a product between these Gaussian envelopes uh, corresponding to the B factors. So you see the good B factors here in the beginning produce flat envelopes and the bad ones give us envelopes that, that uh, go down more rapidly. And these envelopes are multiplied with what are called D factors. Those are nuisance parameters that describe how much signal there is in the first place in every given frequency band. And uh, once we have these envelopes, uh, we normalize them, which gives us our uh, actual recombination weights. Uh, we normalize them such that they sum up to one. So you see that uh, the low frequencies are then taken from all the frames more or less equally, while the very high frequencies are only taken from the very best frames. And uh, now that we have these weights, we just recombine the frames as before, which gives us uh, recombined frames that maximize the signal to noise ratio. And here you see some results. First, the B factors themselves. So this is the exact same alignment by Bayesian polishing, uh, where the B factors have been measured using the old method, the dotted line, and the new method. And you note how they do tell the same story, but the new method gives us a much smoother curve. And because the curve is not being actually smooth, they're regularized in any way, uh, this implies that the, the results are just much less noisy than the previous ones. And here you see uh, a comparison of B factors for Bayesian polishing and the traditional polishing. Uh, note that this purple curve, and this is the only one, uh, does not have any uh, relation to the vertical positional relation to the black one, uh, because uh, the purple curve had been published years be before it did that. Uh, this is only about the shape, but the important thing is that uh, there used to be this huge dip in the very beginning uh, that's now mostly gone using Bayesian polishing. And here is a comparison with motion core two. Now these two curves uh, do correspond to each other because I've computed both of them myself. Um, here I've treated the frames aligned using one method as just an additional set of frames. So the B factors are all in relation to each other. And we note that for one motion core two does have a slightly bigger dip in the beginning, although it is certainly better than the original polishing. But uh, for every single frame, Bayesian polishing gives us slightly better B factors. And if we look at the corresponding FSCs, we note that uh, there actually is an improvement. So here you see the two different implementations of uh, motion core two, 
uh, the original closed source implementation and uh, the open source implementation by Takanori. And uh, we see that Bayesian polishing outperforms both, although not by a dramatic amount, especially up here for, uh, with the ribosome below three angstroms. The improvement is really just a 0 0.06 angstroms. But uh, the improvement is real and uh, consistent. So, so much for the single particle part. There are three things I kind of regret about this. It's still open. Uh, first of all, we have never separated the effects of stage drift from the actual beam induced motions, motion. And uh, these are two completely different effects. So it would make sense to model them separately. Um, specifically, one could afford tighter priors on the actual beam induced motion then. Second, we assume the motion parameters to be constant for all the frames. We know that this is not realistic. We've known that for almost a decade now. Uh, however, the main reason I kept it like this is because the hyperparameter optimization is already very problematic and it would be, it might become untractable if we added two or four additional parameters, which we would need. However, if somebody could come up with an analytical way in analytical formulation equation of how these, uh, the amount of motion decays, uh, this would make things a lot easier. And thirdly, I don't think this is very important, but people keep mentioning it and actually did do this. Uh, in the final Bayesian polishing, we treat every individual frame as if it were static. In reality, we know, of course, that the particles don't just skip from one position to the other, but they move during every single frame. And now if we assumed the trajectories during a frame to be linear and to have sharp, sharply delineated edges, the proper way to proper thing to do would be to filter them using sync weights in Fourier space, which would flip certain frequencies. And I had tried that, and it didn't produce uh, any significant improvements. And also, it would have required making additional changes to the rest of Reliant to make to make full use of it. And then I found out that uh, Kai had actually already done this in the past. So because the idea wasn't uh, at that point, my idea wasn't novel and not very useful, so it never went into the Bayesian polishing. A little addition here, if we do not assume that uh, we know the sharp boundaries of every per frame trajectory, then probably anisotropic B factors would be a better choice than sync weights. Those wouldn't flip frequencies, they would just dampen the frequencies in the, in the direction of motion. So much for single particle analysis. And now a few words on the more recent adaptation to tomography. So this is still uh, not entirely complete. Uh, but it is very, very similar to the 2D case. Mathematically, there are only these three changes that we make. Um, first, the particle positions are, of course, given in 3D, in tomography, not in 2D. But since our covariance matrix that we use to con construct our deformation basis only takes distances between particles anyway, it doesn't care if those distances are measured in two or three dimensions. Um, also, the basis that we obtain is scalar anyway. So uh, the only thing that here changes really changes here is that the, the trajectory parameters or deformation parameters Q now have three coefficients each and not two. And uh, thirdly, um, we need for the data term, we need to access the cross correlation at the specific 2D position. And uh, in tomography, we are, first, we are first given a 3D position of the particle, so we have to project it into the uh, corresponding tilt view of that specific frame. But this is not a problem. We assume that we know this matrix anyway, uh, and this is still equally differentiable and everything. So here, nothing really changes very much. Uh, there are some finer differences when you go into the details. Uh, specifically, in tomography, every frame already requires a rigid alignment anyway, uh, because they're collected independently of each other. And uh, in our framework, <clears throat> we subject this to, the optim to optimization as well. Uh, therefore, in this case, the, what used to be stage drift in single particle, which is, but it's just the rigid alignment in, in tomography, is actually really separate, uh, separated from the actual deformation estimation. So we've taken care of the first of our regrets here. And furthermore, uh, in tomography, the tilt images are not collected in one go. Uh, instead, um, the illumination is switched off or the, the, the sample is not illuminated while it, while it is being tilted. And during that time, it is safe to assume that the particles come to rest. And then when we illuminate it for the next uh, tilt image, they accelerate again. And there is no reason to assume that they will accelerate in the same direction again. So the acceleration prior or temporal smoothness prior makes no sense anymore. So this one has been dropped. And that's, that's all. 
um, beyond that, it, it works the same way. Uh, however, our preliminary results are quite disappointing. We don't have any safe numbers yet, but it doesn't seem to actually help very much, or at all, really. Uh, the most obvious reason is that in tomography it might not matter because the re resolutions are so low, but this cannot really be it. Tomography has reached, almost reached, or has reached uh, three angstroms now. And at that re uh, resolution on the ribosome before, you could see some tiny improvement. Uh, another possible reason is that tomography samples uh, are never actually lose solutions of independent molecules. If they were, then there would be no reason to uh, resort to tomography because it's much more uh, work, it, it's much more labor intensive. It takes much more time. Um, so tomography samples always, almost always contain lattices or things in membranes or things that st stick together in some way, and all of this uh, removes the deformation component of the motion. And thirdly, possibly, uh, tomography samples are usually much, much thicker. And so, since we've been explaining the motion by deformation of the ice, and this deformation requires energy, it would make sense to assume that uh, thicker ice would require more energy to bend and would thus bend less. We don't know which one of these is uh, the most important one, but these are our current results. That's all from my side. I would like to uh, thank these people here uh, for their invaluable support and their sound advice. And also I was asked to point out that uh, Schorz is looking for to fill a new postdoc position that has to do with machine learning at the LMB. And I would actually strongly recommend uh, considering this. It's a great place to work and you learn a lot there. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be taking your questions now. <laughs>